Great. We're going to go ahead and get started. It's nice to see everyone on another inclement weather morning. Sorry, I'm going to drop this. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Anne Short Ginati, who's here from Boston University, where she's associate professor in the Department of Earth and Environment and a faculty fellow at the S. Purdy Center for um, Study of Longer Range Futures. Dr. Short Ginati is an interdisciplinary social scientist and geographer who works with communities and uh, solution based or problem based studies uh, focused on conservation and environment and human community interactions. And with that, I'll let her tell us about uh, science and care in environmental controversies, the politics of deer management in suburban Massachusetts. All right, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. Thanks for uh, an introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see a little snow. There's a little bit more than there was in Boston. Um, I always start by giving like a little bit of a deeper introduction to myself as a scholar, especially um, in audiences that come from different backgrounds. Um, so like Shannon said, I'm an interdisciplinary environmental social scientist and a human environment geographer. The geographer part means that I'm really interested in the ways that humans interact with the environment, kind of how we co-produce space uh, and the back and forth between human and non-human uh, elements, and how and why those relationships vary and interact across space and time. The interdisciplinary part means that I like to work across disciplinary boundaries. And I like to do this both in the space of geography and social science, kind of drawing from different thought traditions and pulling ideas uh, that don't always interact um, into conversation with each other. And it also means I like to collaborate uh, with natural and social scientists who ask questions in a very different way um, and who use methods that are very different than my own. Um, as Shannon said, I like to uh, find research pro projects that are also problem-based. So uh, I, I ask questions that have some sort of relevance to people who are doing work on the ground. There's a little bit of an element of co-production in there. My research uh, trajectory or, or program has all centered on questions related to the social and political aspects of conservation, land, wildlife management, and most recently also urban climate action and justice. Uh, and in the trajectory of my work, I started um, in my dissertation research. I was working in very rural spaces, and I've kind of slowly moved. My first project as a faculty member was conservation across rural to urban gradients, and I've kind of slowly moved into the cities. Um, and I started working in rural spaces because I thought I really wanted to be in these beautiful places near a lot of nature and beauty. And I ended up in the cities because I think it's really exciting to see where the nature is everywhere. So today I'm gonna to talk about some work that I've been doing on the politics and management of white-tailed deer in suburban and urban areas across the Northeastern US. Um, across the US, growing populations of deer have raised concerns and spawned debates about what to do with them, uh, particularly in places where they're flourishing, debates that uh, I imagine many of you are fairly familiar with in different contexts. So I've been looking at uh, these controversies over the past eight or nine years, thinking about the processes um, and interactions between people that just drive what people actually decide to do and why. So I'm gonna preview, before I dive in, preview a few themes um, that will rise up, some uh, very directly um, and some kind of subtly um, in my talk today. First is just the recognition of the role that deer and other non-humans, ticks, uh, bacteria, trees, uh, that they all play in conservation politics. We think often about politics as a realm of humans, but really all of these non-humans are very active actors. They're not active with intention, but actors in kind of influencing what happens in the space of human action. Second, I wanna highlight the way that nature and the environment can have many meanings for different people. And it's important to hold on to the ways that uh, what we want from the world outside of humans differs across different people because that figures a lot into these controversies. Third, I'll give attention to the ways that conservation is often thought about saving things and protecting things, yet it also involves a lot of death. 
And it's really important to grapple with what that means. Um, not just death, but also killing, actually. Um, and then last, the space that I think I'm going to focus on the most is um, in really giving attention to the intersection of science, values and interests, ideas about the environment, and emotions in these controversies. <clears throat> so I'm going to start by motivating um, my talk with this article that was in the Boston Globe a couple years ago. The headline was, The New Golden Age of Wildlife in New England. And in this article, uh, the journalist interviewed wildlife agency directors and, in, uh, and talked about the ways that these agency directors were highlighting the growing and diverse wildlife populations in their states and really celebrating this growth and attributing these healthy populations to active and successful wildlife management and conservation over the past 120 years or so. The author notes that the region uh, is experiencing a boom in point and chow animals. Um, and kind of the whole tone of this article is celebration. But the proliferation of wildlife, uh, particularly in places where people live, uh, is not just a celebration. Uh, it's not always neat and tidy. It's not just how managers intend. Um, and it's not just the result of good management questions. Many of these species that they're talking about as flourishing are flourishing not in wild or forested landscapes, but in cities, in suburbs, and in other spaces that are dominated by humans. Many, or even actually most of the pictures uh, that you'll see through this are taken um, where I live in Boston. I, I maintain my social media presence almost exclusively to have access to the photos that my neighbors post of wildlife. Uh, I live in a neighborhood called Jamaica Plain, uh, where we have very fear-inducing turkeys. Um, so most of the pictures are taken really like in the heart of Boston. Wildlife make non-human nature in the cities very visible and present. Wildlife in suburban areas make those suburban spaces less comfortable and more wild, more out of control of humans. And so wildlife are present in these places in ways that are really celebrated and also ways that are uncomfortable and unwelcome. Many of these species that are thriving uh, have come to be seen by some as pests or problems. And this, uh, when they come to be seen as pests or problems, this raises questions and drives controversy about if, how, when, and what to do about them. Should we actively intervene and manage these wildlife or not? These situations uh, become very tricky because this golden age of wildlife generates new human wildlife assemblages. So new groups of humans and non-humans that are coming together and interacting in new ways. Contemporary approaches to wildlife conservation and management in the United States developed in a very different context. Agencies with responsibility for wildlife management have a longer history of working in a more rural context and have a longer history of managing wildlife in order to protect wildlife that are threatened. This means that the models, both the ecological population models, but also the conceptual models and approaches uh, that underlie wildlife management are tailored to rural behaviors, rural values, rural social relations, rural landscapes, rural institutions, and rural wildlife themselves. But the values, relations, behaviors, landscapes, institutions, and even those non-humans themselves behave differently in suburban and urban areas. So my work in this space is really driven by a question about what's happening in the suburbs, what's happening in urban areas. What are the human and non-human characteristics and processes that shape wildlife management in urban and non-urban or in urban and suburban areas? Part of this is, a is an implied descriptive question about what's happening. And then part of it, uh, and more core to it, is a question about why. Why does this unfold in different ways? And uh, why do wildlife or deer become the object of management in some places and not in others? And how and why are certain management strategies adopted in some areas and not others? So I've been working on a few overlapping projects that use deer as a lens into these questions about managing urban and suburban uh, wilds for the past seven or eight years. 
Over that time, our research activities have included a census of municipal regulations, concerns, and management about deer. We've done this across the state of Massachusetts, also the state of New York, and I'm going to talk exclusively about Massachusetts today. Um, and we did this by collecting information on local bylaws and restrictions that limit hunting in different areas, and then also a survey of municipal officials about their concerns um, and what they've done. And then we've also done case studies of management decisions and controversies about deer um, in a suburban park south of Boston, as well as, as well as five municipalities. And so we've done a series of interviews with staff at state agencies, town officials, uh, folks working at nonprofit organizations, residents, protesters, um, and hunters. We've done a document review and policy review where we pulled both archival notes about kind of the history of different landscapes and also cu current controversies and policies. We attended a lot of meetings uh, from 2015 to 2020. In one of our towns, we did a survey of residents. Um, and then uh, the paper that I'll talk the most about today, we did a community peer review process where prior to sending it out for scientific peer review, we sent it out to the community, to all the people we interviewed um, and other residents. We invited them to a meeting. We gave a presentation on the um, paper itself, and we had small group discussion with them about the paper itself. This is all complemented by work that my collaborators do um, collecting ecological data. Uh, we have camera traps and have done a network of uh, vegetation surveys, um, and then also some integrated modeling approaches. But I'm not going to talk about that. Deer make a really useful case study to think about wildlife management for several reasons. In part, because they hold both this dual status as like very cute uh, Bambi, there's like the Bambi effect, um, and also because they're often hated by people, and, they, and also because they have a really dramatic population history. So this figure um, shows an estimate of deer populations in Massachusetts from colonization through the 20th century. And the pattern holds across much of the northeastern United States, where following uh, colonization, white-tailed deer were hunted nearly to extinction. Their population rebounded in the past century or so. Um, and this rebound is often discussed as a man uh, management success. So deer are held up as this really wonderful uh, picture of conservation success, but also they're a real conservation challenge. So in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was a change in approach and a growth in active management of game species in particular. And this was a result of both the, the impending extinction of deer, also bison and other game species. Um, and there was a push to uh, take active management. And through this process, this was eventually formalized in what's called the North American Model of Conservation, um, <coughs> excuse me, of wildlife conservation. And in this model of management, which still uh, is our framework for thinking about how we manage wildlife broadly, we see wildlife held as a public resource, as a public good, fish as well. And they're managed uh, for non-commercial use uh, using a, a technocratic expert-based process that's um, based in the best evidence and science that's out there. In Massachusetts, uh, there was a 10-year moratorium that started in 1898 on deer hunting and strict limits since then. So the rebound of deer is certainly a, a management success. It shows how much change can happen uh, with various regulatory interventions and changes of behavior. But it was also facilitated by the extirpation of primary non-human predators. Uh, so there are no longer gray wolf or cougars in these areas. Uh, and land use patterns that created, and land use changes that created really good habitat for deer. And it was also facilitated by the movement and the behaviors of the deer themselves. Deer are incredibly adaptable, and so they shifted very easily into new habitats. They changed some of their behaviors in the absence of pre predators, and they adapted their diet to include both wild and cultivated selections. So in Massachusetts, deer populations are now thought, as well as elsewhere, are thought to exceed um, pre-colonial numbers. But they're not distributed evenly. <clears throat> the highest densities of deer are found in suburban areas. And the success in suburban areas is in part because deer are very comfortable around humans. 
Uh, and also because they move, uh, they like edge habitat, and so they move very easily between forest patches and residential backyards. They benefit from, like I said, the absence of non-human predators, but they also benefit from the presence of uh, supplemented food sources. Uh, so we create quite a wonderful um, garden for these deer through either planting and then also sometimes direct feeding. Deer also benefit from cultural institution and built landscape features that limit hunting. So there's no non-human predators and then human predation has also dropped. Hunting restrictions uh, can be codified into local bylaws. And so many towns have restrictions uh, that prohibit the use of firearms, that prohibit the use of uh, archery, or limit how and where it can be used. used. And in this top figure, uh, to orient you, Massachusetts uh, is a coastal city on the right. And so all those areas that are shaded in are like uh, suburbs, uh, excuse me, Boston, uh, are suburbs of Boston. And then it gets more rural as you go further west. So in this top figure, any of those towns that are colored in are towns that have restrictions on hunting. Um, and the towns that are white do not. Hunting is also limited by setback restrictions. And so there's a buffer uh, around roads and around structures that prohibit the discharge of weapons in that particular area. Um, and so in higher density settings, the setbacks limit where hunting is even possible. So in this bottom map, what you see is the percentage of land that's outside of those setbacks. So in the higher density areas, you have spaces where uh, less than 15% of the land is even possibly open to hunting. But that is just the area that's outside of the setbacks. It doesn't take into any consideration of whether hunting actually would make sense in that space at all. Whereas um, in the, the darker colors have more uh, land available, you have upwards of 65 to 80% of the area that is possibly open to hunting. So these figures give a sense of some of the institutional limits on hunting in Massachusetts, but these map also to other spaces as well. The return of deer um, in Massachusetts is a relatively recent phenomenon, especially when compared to other uh, states across um, the Atlantic region. Uh, early sightings are mentioned around the mid like 1980s, but that would be like a very exciting sighting of a deer. Um, and then deer, we started to see a more dramatic increase in the 2000s. Deer sightings are often welcomed at first, but at high density, deer and residential landscapes become a concern for some residents, for some municipal officials, and for state wildlife managers. At high densities, deer can alter forested ecosystems, uh, and they also impact humans through property damage. And this can be damage to residential properties uh, and vegetation, but also damage to timber stands or agricultural properties. They impact humans through deer vehicle collisions, um, or arguably humans impact deer through deer vehicle collisions, um, and concerns about Lyme disease. Though as I'll talk about, this relationship is contested, complex, and changing um, in the space of what people know and think about deer. So concerns about all of these different impacts have prompted residents, town officials, land managers, and state inter uh, agencies to try to intervene. These interventions can take the form of individual actions, so people create giant fences around their gardens, they change landscaping practices, they use deer repellents. The interventions can also take the form of coordinated actions of landowners who work together to try to open up properties for hunting. It can take the form of municipalities that change their local bylaws or open municipal lands up for hunting. Outside of Massachusetts, these interventions can take the form of deer culls. Uh, which is lethal control that's happening outside of the regular recreational hunting. In Massachusetts, we don't do that. Um, and then it can take the form of non-lethal efforts. Uh, so contraceptive or sterilization, though those are um, actually very difficult to implement because of the, the regulatory process around them. So in Massachusetts, we see that some towns have changed their local bylaws. Uh, or changed their hunting policies or opened up their lands to create conditions that allow hunting or change hunting access. <clears throat> In our municipal survey, we asked 
uh, town officials whether deer were a concern um, in their town. And then we also asked them about what types of deer management activities have they done or thought about in the past decade. And so what this figure shows um, is that any of those towns that are highlighted in the dark red are towns that have taken actions to manage deer in the past decade and have expressed concerns about deer. Uh, any of the communities that are highlighted in orange are communities that have expressed concerns about deer but haven't taken actions. Any of the uh, communities that have a dot on them are communities that considered um, deer management actions but didn't implement them. And then the greenish color uh, expressed no concern about deers. Deer. And what we see is that across Massachusetts, about 20% of communities have either thought about or changed their hunting strategies or local bylaws to address deer. And most of that is concentrated um, in these urban and suburban areas. And this happens, of course, because this confluence of factors that forces uh, or that has enabled deer to flourish in these areas, but also limited hunting. And one of the things that's important um, in this context is that this uh, process of suburbanization and this process of landscape change and this process of where deer are has shifted the locus of control of management away from state agencies to smaller actors at a lower level of government. So in the United States, wildlife is the property of everyone. But state and federal agencies have the responsibility for managing that wildlife. However, state agencies can only do this job when they have the influence and capacity to use the tools that are at their hands for management. And so what we see in the suburbs is a situation where the tools that state agencies have are no longer effective because the tool in Massachusetts for managing deer is hunting through recreational hunters. But if there's very limited land available, that tool is not effective. And so local actors begin to have power because there are things that local actors can do to create more space available for hunting. So we see this difference in sort of who's in control um, of the landscape and who's in control of hunting. And this is important because what we then see is a patchwork of management, where communities are side by side, uh, or properties are side by side, that have similar ecological conditions, that maybe have similar deer conditions, but have very different management strategies. And those different management strategies then uh, intersect and create differences across those uh, property boundaries or jurisdiction lines. Which gets me back to this question. So why do some communities act, some landowners act, and others not? My research team is not the first team to be interested in these questions. Deer are possibly the most studied species uh, from both an ecological perspective, but also a human dimensions perspective. And so, so I often get asked, like, well, why are you doing this? Because everybody studies deer. Um, we study deer because we think that even though everybody studies deer, there's a lot of space to learn from them. <clears throat> so much of the um, research on the human dimensions of wildlife and deer management has taken the form of resident surveys about perceptions of deer and has taken the form of surveys of hunters about why they hunt, where they hunt, when they hunt or resident surveys about their perceptions of different management actions. This work can be helpful. Uh, it can be helpful for understanding the nature of human-deer relations. It can be helpful for understanding uh, societal attitudes towards deer and different management actions, which can help uh, agencies think about what they want to do. It can be helpful for understanding individual behavior and responses, but it doesn't tell us very much about how and why policies actually emerge or how and why management happens. So my focus is much more about local, on local policies rather than resident views. Why large landowners, why groups of people come together, or why governments take action. In the literature that exists in human dimensions, there's uh, the framework for thinking about this type of change um, is commonly, uh, the, the one that's commonly used is called cultural carrying capacity sometimes referred to wildlife acceptance capacity or sociolo uh, socio sociological caring capacity. And all of these names uh, mean basically the same thing, but it's understood to be the maximum population of deer that can coexist with humans. And this idea is a, a conceptual idea that's uh, based on theory. 
It parallels the idea of biological or ecological carrying capacity, so it has a sort of intuitive nature to it. In the literature, it's discussed as uniquely determined for particular communities, stemming from perceptions, values, beliefs, attitudes, and experiences. And the idea underneath this is that there's some population size that will minimize conflict between deer and people, but also minimize conflict between people about deer. And underneath this idea is the suggestion that we can find this ideal number, and that when we do, we'll balance the positive and negative and have some socially optimal outcome. I think that this can be a really helpful heuristic for thinking about the ways that human tolerance may be lower than what uh, the forest can support. I think this can be helpful to maybe facilitate conversations around stakeholders, but I think it's really problematic when we use this to think about why uh, policies emerge and how behaviors change. And I think it's problematic mostly because it flattens the community. It implicitly assumes that these interactions are equal and suggests that the process proceeds in some sort of straightforward fashion where once kind of the community collectively has this problem, then we go forward and decide to manage deer. But we see controversy emerge precisely because the community is not flat, precisely because different people have different relationships to deer and different relationships to the problems that have. So our research over the past almost decade now uh, focuses on these much messier processes. And so our work highlights the ways that forest health, wildlife health, animal welfare, and human health are all entangled in these political processes. This is a probably a terrible figure to put up, uh, but I'm doing it anyway. Uh, maybe my, my one mistake today. Anyway, what this shows is we uh, looked at a whole bunch of towns that have had and chosen to manage deer or open conversations but had been relatively well documented. We looked at the reasons that they describe as the reason that they started this conversation, and then the reason that's ultimately documented as the rationale for management if they decided to manage. And what we see when we looked at all of this uh, is that broadly, uh, the idea of overpopulation generally is very common in these discourses and discussions about what uh, managing, but that Lyme disease figures really prominently as a motivator um, for, for opening these discussions and then also as a rationale for management up to about 2010, 2011. And after that, we see the way that Lyme disease is talked about changes dramatically. And we see that forest health is the other common reason uh, across many towns for implementing a management plan or opening this discussion. And we see that that sort of stays through time. So we see this objective or evolution of objectives for why communities are talking about deer, and in particular, the way that Lyme disease comes into these conversations. And that reflects changing public understanding of what that science is. Um, and then we see that this also links to strategies for management. And so in many of the conversations that we had with people who have been involved in these processes, they talk about how important Lyme disease is for galvanizing public support of management. And so communities that started to manage their deer prior to 2010, Lyme disease was really important for getting over this hump where communities say, we don't want to manage deer, to we're comfortable managing deer because Lyme disease is so threatening. When the science becomes more complicated, that argument is less compelling, and it's much harder to uh, get people on the same page. Uh, forest health is not as unifying um, of a concern. We also see, and this is really important when you think about that idea of cultural caring capacity, we see the importance of individuals in driving these policies. And so why are there towns that are next to each other that have really different policies? It's because in one town there's some guy that really has a bee in his bonnet about deer. In another town there's a woman whose uh, neighbors and husband all got Lyme disease and took it to the state senator and changed our state policy on deer. There's individuals that play a huge role in these processes, and we have to be attentive to that level of micropolitics, the really small level politics that are shaping these processes. 
And then lastly, uh, we've seen that there's conflicting ideas about what it means to have suburban nature um, and what we want our suburban environments to look like. And this last scene, <coughs> excuse me, this last point intersects uh, with these ideas on importance of science and values and the ways that we prioritize science in making decision making. So in the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus on uh, one particular town, Carlisle. Uh, there's a picture of uh, bucolic Carlisle uh, and the controversy as it unfolded in Carlisle. And I focus on Carlisle um, in part because it's just this beautiful example of how this controversy unfolded and how the community leaned on science to solve their problem. And what I think and our analysis of this is that people expect too much of science. I, I love science. I think we should make decisions with data. I just want to say that outright. Uh, but I think we lean too much on science to make decisions. So people in this community wanted science to solve a problem. That was a problem about values, interests, and imaginaries about what they want their world to be. So here's the story. Carlisle is a small, fairly wealthy community uh, northwest of Boston. It's a suburb. Like many of the suburban towns across the northwestern United States, they've grappled with what to do about growing deer populations. In 2015, there were two town committees, the Lyme Disease Committee. Many of our uh, communities in Massachusetts have dedicated Lyme Disease Committees um, and the Conservation Committee. They began to jointly investigate the issue of deer. And they began to jointly investigate the issue of deer because they were concerned both about uh, Lyme disease and also about the impacts of deer on local ecosystems. And they were doing this to investigate the question of should we do something about deer in our community? Should we actively manage deer to address these two issues? In Massachusetts, active management means, at, particularly in suburban areas, means finding ways to increase volunteer recreational hunting. Like I mentioned earlier, culling is not an option. And so when communities start investigating this, mostly what that looks like is deciding whether they're gonna have a controlled hunt on town land or whether they're going to allow hunters on town land during hunting season. And most communities opt for um, having archery hunting. Firearms are very, very uncommon um, in suburban communities. So over the next two and a half years, this town, Carlisle, formed a deer committee at the town level. The deer committee was formed to investigate this question. They invited outside experts to town meetings to talk about deer and deer management. These outside experts included um, representatives from Mass Wildlife. It included representatives from neighboring towns that had decided to manage deer. It included Alan Rutberg, who uh, is a, a researcher at Tufts who's done a lot of work on sterilization um, and has worked with some of the communities in the Hudson Valley to implement sterilization experiments. <clears throat> they collected management plans from nearby communities. They engaged in this very data intensive process. Um, and they had public meetings to collect uh, public input. They had a non-binding town vote to assess community support for the deer committee. Um, and they concluded at the end of this that deer management to prevent Lyme disease or to reduce Lyme disease risk was not a good strategy. That the science wasn't there to back that up. But they, they also concluded that it was worth it to address concerns about forested ecosystems and the impact of deer. So the deer committee implemented a pilot hunt in 2018 uh, in order to protect the forest. Following the pilot hunt, opposition to this hunt grew. Uh, and the tone of the public deliberations went from this like respectful data-driven process to uh, very divisive and involving many personal attacks over the next two years. And in response to this growing acrimony um, and also the need to focus town resources on COVID, in 2020, the governing committee for the town, the Select Board, board voted to suspend the hunting program. So they had this pilot hunt for two years and then they stopped it. So in the space of five years, 2015 to 2020, the issue of what to do about deer evolved from this open inquiry to this acrimonious, uh, divisive town debate that, in the words of one town official, is hurting the town. And there are a few things that are common 
uh, that we see in this particular way this unfolded that are common in other places as well. One is that it was divisive. Debates about wildlife management are often heated, they're often emotional, uh, and even when the discussion is limited to the space of science, those emotions are still there. We also saw a similar uh, shift in this discussion from Lyme disease to forest health that I alluded to earlier. And then the part that I'm going to focus on now is that what we saw in the public debate and discussion, in addition to these divisive moments, was a focus on, on uncertainty as the reason to not go forward with this debate and a focus on the idea that the way that this debate should proceed is as a debate about the science and the debate about the science and how it applies in the local space. And we had started to pay attention to this language of uncertainty, this focus on data and data avail availability because we'd seen it in other places. So in our work, we'd seen comments like, just count the deer, um, or things like, I'm not opposed to hunting, I just don't think the data is there. Comments like that are very common across different uh, cases that we were looking at and reasons that people proposed hunting activities. And so we became really interested in how and why different actors focused on and leveraged data and uncertainty in these deliberations and how that intersects with the sometimes unspoken norms and values that relate to their own positions. So just a couple notes on uncertainty. Right, so uncertainty refers to the lack of clarity or confidence around a body of evidence or what data shows. In uh, scientific inquiry and management, uncertainty is often understood as an obstacle that you overcome through more data collection, experimentation, and modeling. And then there's a growing uh, attention to the ways that we can think about uncertainty in other ways. So in human environment geography and science and technology study, scholars have begun to pay attention to the ways that uncertainty functions politically. And you can probably think of other examples where you see this, particularly in the space of climate change. Uh, there's a great book about, uh, about this that relates to um, regulation of cigarettes and industry in man manufacturing uncertainty and thinking about that. But this growing body of scholarship functions uh, gives attention to the ways that uncertainty can be leveraged as a resource, um, the ways that it can be used to cause controversy and delay action. And so this is sort of our way of thinking about um, uncertainty. Though I think what's important to note before I keep talking is that in this space, often when people are talking about uncertainty, it's like in the context of like climate change denial, we are saying, oh, uncertainty is being used by these bad, powerful industry, industry economically powerful actors. In this space, we're not seeing that difference. We're seeing industry leveraged by people who are opposed to the hunt, but not because of economic interests, but because of other interests that are there. So some context for Carlisle and the deliberations that happened. What we saw across our examination of public meetings um, and in our interviews, both supporters and opponents of the hunt in Carlisle emphasized the importance of data and emphasize the importance of evidence-based decision-making. One of our interviewees characterized the town. We asked them to talk about how you would describe their town. They said, we're a data-driven town. Uh, and so across all of the people that we were talking to, there was a very strong um, attention to the role of science, the role of evidence, and leaning on this. And they would frame their positions in terms of this normative goal of care, though, for nature. Everybody wants to do the, the right thing. Um, in this debate. <clears throat> Those who are opposed to the hunt, though, talked very much about how they're opposed to the hunt because they lack trust in the data that's coming from the experts and because of lack of sufficient ecological data and evidence to support this management. And I'll talk a little bit about this. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how both the, the folks that are most in support of the hunt and opposed to the hunt characterize their positions. <clears throat> so those in favor of the hunt describe hunting as an effective and necessary form of science-based ecosystem management in the face of a deer population that's impacting local forests. In policy documents, meetings, 
observations and interviews, supporters of the hunt emphasized the ecological damage of deer and focused on the um, impacts to the forest understory. They appealed to management targets and expertise that's offered by the state agency, um, Mass Wildlife. Mass Wildlife also provided, or provided the town with a rough regional population estimate. All the, all the estimates are at the regional level. Um, and they conducted surveys of deer browse on several properties in the town. And Mass Wildlife concluded based on those surveys that these areas are heavily impacted. In the public debate and interviews, those who were opposed to the hunt, though, argue that there hasn't been adequate proof for the need for or effectiveness of hunting as a deer management strategy in Carlisle. And those opposed to the hunt raise questions about the number of deer in Carlisle, the effects of deer on forested ecosystems, and the effectiveness of bow hunting to reduce those populations. And then admits this uncertainty, those who are opposed to the hunt argue that Carlisle shouldn't go forward with the hunt. They sometimes note other concerns, concerns about public safety. They sometimes note concerns about uh, the practices of hunters or the culture of hunters. Um, and they occasionally note positions about the morality of hunting. Many of those, though, who are opposed to the hunt emphasized over and over again that they would be open to the idea of hunting if the evidence supported it. And this was seen as a way to make sure that they were seen as legitimate, that they weren't opposed to hunting themselves, they were opposed to hunting in the absence of enough evidence. So when describing their opposition, they noted the science just wasn't coming into it. Residents and town officials tend to see their own positions on either side as rational, scientific, and objective, and they tend to characterize the positions on the other side in terms of ethics and interests. And so this image up here, uh, when we sent out a resident survey in, um, in Carlisle, someone gifted us with this characterization of the debate. Um, we, di we didn't ask for this. Um, this was just a gift. But it, it, it sort of adequately and accurately describes how they view each other. But people on either sides of the debate don't view themselves this way. So then in our interviews, though, uh, we see that people rarely talked about their own interests, but they very quickly characterized the other side. So, um, where am I? here we go. Supporters of the hunt describe those who are opposed to the hunt as animal lovers, animal rights folks, folks who believe that all life is precious and therefore that all hunting is unethical. This is how supporters characterize the opposition, but the opposition does not characterize themselves. Opponents of the hunt characterize supporters as being deeply um, entwined in a pro-hunting agenda. A pro-hunting agenda that's pushed by state agencies and hunters themselves uh, because of the ways that state agencies are funded through hunting licenses. So across this conflict, we see both sides grounding their positions in science and evidence and leaning on the space of a scientific discussion as the space of legitimate discourse. We also see uh, interviewees rarely talking about their own interests beyond kind of a broad statement of care about the environment. So the point of contention seems to be the availability of sufficient information from a trusted source. Yet across our conversations, it's unclear if any level of data would constitute sufficient information for many of those who are opposed to the hunt. So we argue that though the debate has centered on data, the disagreement isn't really about data. Instead, the disagreement is rooting in underlying and usually unstated ethical positions and interests that shape participants' assessment of who's trustworthy and what data is sufficient and so this leaning on science is obscuring all of these other incredibly important uh, questions. So underneath this conflict about data and uncertainty, there are different ideas about what suburban nature is, what it's for, and how humans should respond now that humans have messed it up. Proponents of the hunt focus on the idea of healthy forests that are very much informed by a desire for biodiversity, a desire for protection of native species, 
a desire to preserve and restore forests to some ideal state, a vision of human management that's needed to correct the mismanagement and bad actions of humans of the past and present. Opponents of the hunt focus on a suburban environment that's free from violence, available for human connection to nature, stewardship through sanctuary, and non-intervention, a hands-off per uh, perspective to not further mess up all the ways that humans have already messed up. These positions then shape assessment of what level of uncertainty is acceptable and what data is trustworthy and what evidence is trustworthy. But the ability to talk through and consider these different ideas about suburban nature is limited because they're taken for granted uh, and, they're, and science is seen as the way to negotiate this controversy and topic. Our involvement in this community was at the invitation of the town. They had heard uh, that we had a research project that was focused on deer, and they invited us in to collect um, data in the hopes that data would lay, lead the way out of this disagreement. <clears throat> and so the bigger team that I work with um, includes wildlife ecologists and ecological modelers who have been collecting data about deer and vegetation, as I mentioned. It's possible that this data will definitively show that there are very limited impacts of deer in this community and end the debate. It's possible that this data would show extensive impacts and end the debate. I think it's more likely that the data won't overcome these different ideas about what human nature relations are in Carlisle or what they should be. So while not arguing at all that we should abandon science, evidence, and data, my colleagues and I argue that reliance on science as the primary space for decision making obscures all of these other dimensions that are really important in these controversies. And we wonder in what ways can the debate in Carlisle and, El in Carlisle and elsewhere change if we throw out old assumptions about what management in nature looks like and we make space to more creatively ask, what do residents want of Carlisle forests and wildlife and open spaces? What are suburban open spaces there for? And what do we do when we have conflicting visions of that space? So thinking beyond Carlisle and beyond deer, I wanna close by stepping out again and highlighting a few ideas that, are that were present in this talk, both big and small. Tracing some of the history of deer in New England, population decline, subsequent recovery and growth, highlights the socio-ecological processes that are remaking landscapes it's, a hum it's human interventions, actions, policies, and institutions, along with deer. We focused on deer, but really, actually, it's the ticks that make people do stuff. Uh, and it's the trees, the vegetation, the lady slippers that make people do things. Those are remaking landscapes, but they're also remaking human relations with other humans. The resulting suburban and urban socio-environmental landscapes contain these new human wildlife uh, groups and assemblages. That makes it really hard to know what to do because our tools aren't adapted for those situations. So our decisions about what to do can be informed by evidence, but underneath that, and more important probably, is thinking about all of these other questions. In the wildlife community, politics is seen as a very dirty word. Uh, and there's a desire to use science to be above the fray of politics. But what I want to see is a push towards embracing the politics and recognizing the importance of dealing with the politics and addressing it as a way to more fully understand what's underneath all of these conflicts to make that science more relevant to people and to make it more effective for addressing problems. So there's always a number of people to thank, uh, and these are a few of them. Thanks. Sure. <laughs>
Yeah, that's a great question. So the question for those of you who um, are remote was a question about the role of cherry picking. Um, and so expressing surprise that this conversation was about uncertainty rather than about um, accusations of cherry picking data. So certainly in this community, uh, there are accusations that uh, the whole perspective isn't being taken. Opponents of the hunt uh, lean on and accuse mass wildlife of using science that supports their uh, position. But this is a very, um, a very well-educated community um, with a lot of access uh, to all of your online uh, article repositories. They have read a surprising number of studies about deer. Um, and one of the things that I think can be interesting to think about in the space of cherry picking is the ways that certainly cherry picking happens on all different sides and cherry picking happens in part because there's a lot of studies about deer but also in part because there's a lot that's not known. And so cherry picking is possible uh, either when, yeah, you're only using things at the most extreme or when actually there's this huge gradient of ideas or huge space of ideas and there is uncertainty. And so in this space, there's a, um, an article that I like that uses the term excess of objectivity when talking about the use of science and controversies and says that when there's this excess of objectivity, anybody can find anything to support their position. That's kind of the idea of cherry picking. But I think that what's important about these is that it's not just that anybody can find the data to support it, but there's also an excess of uncertainty. And so it, when they say that there's no local deer estimates, that's true. Uh, when they say that they don't have a good sense of what the impact of deer is on the forest, well, there was a, a local resident who went out who doesn't like uh, the way Mass Wildlife did their studies and did their own study and found something different. Uh, and when they say that the, the jury's out on management, that's a pretty accurate description of the state of what we think about suburban management literature. Um, and so I'm not really in the, like, it becomes tricky to answer this question because I'm not really in the business of adjudicating their conflict. Um, but I, they really do focus on both uncertainty and kind of pulling, pulling what's known to support their positions. So you support your argument that there's uncertainty using science. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, so the question is, did any other strategies come up? So what about reintroduction of predators? So uh, I love that. I, um, I toyed with the idea of writing an article about rewilding the suburbs by introducing human predators. Uh, but that just, I didn't have anywhere to go from just the, the abstract after that. Um, but n n no. Because, because like, if you reintroduce wolves or cougars, you're creating a whole number of human wildlife conflicts, right? So predators don't get along very well with humans in the suburbs. People did talk a lot about um, the limits in Massachusetts and the reliance on the North American model, which really prioritizes hunters, uh, recreational hunters. Um, and so uh, there are some organizations that we've worked with that really, really, really hope our research shows that culling is effective because they would like to use it uh, if that's what we find, uh, to push for state legislation to kind of shift that dialogue. Um, and then there was also a desire to explore non-lethal methods, um, but those are just prohibitively dif difficult because they're not proven management strategies, so they, they have the status of experiments, so they require a different set of permits um, and research partners to do that. Yeah, Jane. I'm wondering, do you see a similar sway of someone like in your position 
know, both of these sides are saying they're using science, and then it's interesting that they again go to scientists to get more science. And um, if there are any using science, do you feel like a more authoritative individual can't have that much sway, or do you also see them having this like, oh, we, we actually trust that person's? That's, that's a great question also. Um, so the question is, uh, thinking about this issue of savvy individuals, then what becomes the role of authorities, experts, um, and academic researchers like myself and my team, is there space for more sway there? Um, that's, that's something that we're interested in, uh, and if all goes well, we'll study that um, in an experimental process. So the reason we did this survey uh, was to get a baseline of kind of what the community says that they think about different issues. Um, and then the idea is that we will go back with our data, uh, we will give town uh, presentations, and we will resurvey uh, to see if and how ideas change. Working hypothesis is no, they won't change. Uh, the community thinks they will, because the community thinks that the problem is that the data came from mass wildlife. Um, and by having a third party study who's more neutral uh, than mass wildlife, the hope is that that would then change it. But the jury, who knows? Yeah. Just, I guess, following up a bit on that, um, it seems like, did you have any inclination that there was? variation in trust and to where the science was coming from. So it seemed like there was some level of skepticism about mass wildlife, but then you all are brought in and it seems like given a lot more trust than that. So, yeah, so the question is about if there's variation in, in trust um, based on where the science is coming from. And uh, that's a good question, I, and I would say no. Um, I don't think that there is a lot of variation. So we were invited um, from somebody who was on the DEER committee. And the hope of this person on the DEER committee was that being third party, maybe there would be more trust for us. In our initial conversations um, with people who are opposed to the hunt, it didn't seem like at the outset they were very trustworthy of us. We do like a lot of public presentations um, and it is, our, our, our um, wildlife ecologist graduate student is like so well equipped for anything that happens in the rest of his life because he's had not just his qualifying exam with this really lovely community of uh, academic researchers who ask him questions, but this incredibly intense, difficult qualifying exam that he has with this community every time he talks about his research there where they grill him on every aspect of his methods. Um, and so they haven't sort of come at us and at our team and said, oh, look at these people coming from the outside. I bet they're going to give us stuff we can trust. It's like very, um, the starting point is distrust. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the points that you make about these are value issues is really, the, really super important. Yeah. And I can ask two questions. But the first is the value issues. Why don't we just tell people that this is a value issue? Either, and, and there's two value issues, right? Some people are, are nervous about hunting because there's people wandering around the woods with guns. And which leads to my second question, which is why is there no culling, right? Culling allows you to separate the, the our, you know, we don't want to kill deer because we value them versus the, the concern about hunting. But is it is an answer for us to, to say to people, look, it's, this is a value decision, and you as a town are going to have to decide do you want to, have, do you want to control the deer or not, and it's a value issue that the data, you know, you're hiding behind the data. Just put the value issues right around. Yeah, so so the, the question here, there's two questions. The first is why don't we just tell people that this is a value uh, question? Um, and the second one is why is there no culling? Uh, so the, the first question, I, I don't really, or I never really thought of myself as like a missionary, uh, as an academic, uh, a huge, like having a huge agenda. But actually, this is my agenda. I am on a mission to convince wildlife managers that it is okay that people disagree and that it is okay to have values in wildlife management. Because I think that it, in conservation as well, because I think that it is so destructive to not be acknowledging those. I, I've shared this story with a couple of people already, but after this community peer review process, one of the people who was on the select board, I facilitated one of these small group discussions. 
and uh, the select board is the town governing committee. So this person had been involved in all of these discussions, all of these divisive attacks, and was like really tired of this issue. And at the end of the discussion, she said, you know what? I thought that this meeting was gonna be terrible. I thought it was gonna be really boring. I thought you were gonna tell us about our deer numbers, and I thought you were gonna tell us what to do with our deer. But instead, I learned something. I learned that we had approached this problem all wrong. I learned that maybe we should have talked about what it is we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it and talked about it as a community because maybe that would have changed how the conversation unfolded. And so kind of in this microcosm of just this town, we did do that, right? And then I, I present at conferences with a lot of wildlife managers and that's like, that's what we're trying to do. The second question was why no culling? Uh, Massachusetts is a real stickler on the North American model of conservation which says that wildlife exists for uh, the public and culling is taking that resource away from the public. Um, and so it's, New York is not so strict about that, uh, but for Massachusetts, that's, that's the culture of their wildlife agency. Okay, we're gonna end questions there. If you do have more questions, and we'll be at lunch, and then has a very full schedule for the rest of the day, so come to lunch and ask questions. And um, I think there's a happy hour too. And there's a happy hour. Come to the happy hour, please. Thank you very much, and we'll adjourn.